Jury consultant Richard Gabriel is with us now. Thank you for uh, your time. When we're talking about jurors, each case is different and the instructions are different. Walk us through what a jury in this case against a former president as the defendant facing 34 felony counts will be instructed to do and not do as they deliberate. Well, it's obviously a, a fairly complicated set of instructions. And jurors, for the most part, sometimes get a little bit glazed over when it comes to jury instructions. They can be complicated. They can be a lot of legal terms. However, in this case, it's important for two separate reasons. One has to do with that there are two lawyers on this jury who can be the interpreters. Now, they're not supposed to really interpret the law, but at least they can explain and help the jurors, other jurors understand sort of the, the different uh, paths that the instructions give them to take in deciding on a verdict. The other reason is that this is a fairly unique case, the, you know, in terms of illegal campaign contributions and and uh, falsified business records, that's a little bit. So I think the jury's going to be paying close attention to that. I think another instruction that's going to be probably fairly important for them has to do with witness credibility. As you saw for most of the trial, obviously the defense going after very strongly Michael Cohen and saying everything's based on him and his word and you can't trust him. He's a liar. He's the gloat, the greatest liar of all time. And and so the witness instructions say that you can uh, basically believe some part, um, none or all of the witness, depending on a variety of factors, including their nonverbal behaviors. So I think they're going to be paying close attention to that. But a lot of it's going to be focused on how can they connect the evidence, the payments, the, uh, to the actual instructions of whether this is an illegal cam com campaign contribution and a falsified business record. One thing I wonder, Richard, does a jury want to find a verdict unanimous, either guilty or not guilty? Do they go into it as a team? What happens behind that door once it closes? Are they trying to convince one another to get that unanimous verdict? And how does a jury feel when they cannot reach a verdict and it's a hung jury? Well, Marnie, you've just hit the golden question here, which is really what we've waited the entire trial for. What the main element at this point is how do these jurors work together? Obviously, Donald Trump is looking for at least one juror who's going to throw a wrench into the works and is going to say, no, I don't see it, fold their arms, say, I'm, I'm not going to convict. The prosecution needs all 12. They need people to get along and work together. So the personality dynamic of how those jurors actually get along together, it seems from what I've, I've read that they do seem to get along, but how they actually go through the, the, uh, the evidence. And there's usually two types of deliberations that occur. One is a verdict driven, which is just hands up, yes or no on each of the counts, or evidence driven, where they literally take their time and go through the pieces of evidence. How they work together as a group is going to be key right now. The other thing that you have to consider, Richard, and, and we can look at as many cases as we want, but nothing will align with this case and the stakes in this case. You've got a former president facing 34 criminal counts, first time we've seen it in history. The intimidation factor of reaching in a verdict on either side, whether you agree with the prosecution or you are convinced by the defense's arguments, there could be ramifications for this jury. It was why no one probably wanted to serve on this jury. How does that get taken into account? Out behind that that deliberation room it is a pressure it is a, a, an extraordinary pressure because jurors know the world is watching they know that for the most part they're going to be scrutinized and why do they either vote to convict or acquit if they come to a unanimous verdict so it is an incredible pressure how do friends how do family members are how are they going to talk to them about what their verdict is but something really extraordinary does happen when a jury of 12 gets together because sometimes that stuff gets ironed out certainly in the back of their minds there is a moral question how is this going to affect the the presidential election how is this going to affect the future of our country that can be a pressing concern but overall when they're working together as a group of 12 sometimes that stuff disappears and they really are able to focus on the job how are they going through the evidence and what does that lead them to so i have great confidence in a jury to come to a decision in this case it certainly could be a hung jury, but it, it is an amazing process to watch. We've just been told that the jury will not be receiving written instructions 
uh, from the judge on how the deliberation will go, but they can ask questions about it. Is that unusual? And how likely is it, or what is the desire of jurors after a case is over for them to talk, to share what that experience was? Um, well, it's not necessarily unusual. It's too bad um, because having those instructions because they are somewhat complicated and you heard it's going to take about an hour there's a lot of instructions here so having them written to be able to go over themselves i think is going would be important for them nevertheless they can ask questions if they have a concern about this which sometimes gives us a little bit of a clue as to what they're tracking um you know there the implications of what happens afterwards uh, i think a lot of them are going to want to explain their verdict I think some of them are just going to want to go away. They're anonymous at this point. I think the judge is going to hold their names because there can be threats, especially if there's a conviction. I think there's been threats against them. So it it is a, a safety concern. Uh, I worked on the Casey Anthony case and there were death threats against the jurors. I think we all have to really honor the jury system and the jurors themselves. Whatever their verdict is, know that they are trying to do their best. Right. We were not in that courtroom. We did not hear all of the evidence, and we don't know the pressure that this jury is under. And they're just everyday people uh, sitting on a jury in a very high-profile case. Uh, Richard, final question to you. It can be quick, but do you have any prediction how long it might take once the jury begins deliberation, uh, hours, days, into next week? I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I can't imagine it's going to be a quick verdict because there's a lot to go over. So, you know, I think it's going to take at least a few, a couple of days, few days. That being said, uh, they could be come to consensus really quickly on something. But I think they want to take their time because it is an important case. They want to look like, at the very least, that they are really going over the evidence, being comprehensive and coming to a measured decision. Really interesting and relatable because at any point we could all serve on a jury. We've gotten the notices in the mail that you have jury duty. You just never know uh, what jury you'll serve on. Uh, Richard, uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Marnie.